in high school, I was on the speech team, and we would do interpretation of literature, whether it's an after-dinner speech, a comedy, or a dramatic duo with a partner. And I sort of found my niche, and I did really, really well when my brothers were doing the Little League or Soapbox and bringing home trophies for that. I'd bring home first place in humorous interpretation. So I really liked it because I would, because it made people smile and laugh away. And getting trophies didn't hurt. Then I was recruited to be on the speech team at Ohio University and they gave me a scholarship to go there. And I would get comments from the judges, you've got an unusual voice, you should do cartoons. So they sort of planted that seed. And it never occurred to me that I could make a living doing what I love to do. So that was it. And I worked at, I, I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I should find a job. You know, I was about 15 or so. And I was working at a, an ice cream parlor, but I thought, you know, working at a radio station makes much more sense because I could do commercials, I could play with my voice. Next thing you know, I'm working at the radio station. But I lived for the moment that I, like, I got to be a little character for a promotional gimmick for the station on the air, got to use my voice. And a, a, a woman came in, and she was promoting music because it's radio. It was top 40, pop, pop music. And she was just promoting records. And, to, and she worked for Warner Brothers Music. So that to me, Warner Brothers meant Mel Blanc. And I thought, wow, maybe she knows Mel Blanc. So I shook her hand. My boss had introduced me to her. And we started talking about animation. And I told her what I wanted. And she says, well, I, here's my card. You know, write me. Write me a letter. Remind me what you want. And I can maybe help you out and kind of guide you along the way. And she was true to her word. And so I, what I did was I would, I would go up to the radio station after hours and put a little tape together. They call it a demo tape to demonstrate different voices that I did. But a demo tape should be about two minutes long. Mine was about 14 minutes long. And it was these long monologues of these speeches. That, but the thing is that I didn't have anybody telling me, no, you can't do that. You know, and it, it just, I had no stops. My family really encouraged me. Like you and your family, honey, it's like you're surrounded by such love that your, your family adores you, you and your brother. And like that, it was the same thing with my family. They never stopped me from doing what I really, really love. So I felt very safe about that. But you also took, took the risk. I mean, there, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a certain amount of risk. You, you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to, you've yeah. got to walk the walk. You've got to do stuff. That you, right. you can't just sit there and wait for it to come to you because it doesn't happen. No, and I, so I sent her this tape. The next thing you know, she sends me the name of this Dawes Butler. And Dawes Butler did the voice of Huck and Yogi and Quick Draw and Illinois Jetson. And long story short, I started writing to him. We started communicating long distance with him in LA and me in Dayton, Ohio. And within, well, a year, about a year or so later, I transferred from Ohio University to UCLA because it was close to where he lived. But I lived for the Sundays. I would take, I would walk into Westwood at UCLA and take the bus. I didn't have, a, somebody stole my bike within two weeks of living in Los Angeles. That was gone. My mode of transportation, boom, gone. So I was riding the bus and rode the bus to his house for a private lesson that was supposed to be one hour, but it ended up being four hours long. And that was my, that was my meager beginning. And he encouraged me and within, I don't know, a couple of years I had an opportunity and he took me out to Hanna-Barbera and then Within, I don't know, six months or so, I got my first job. It was before I graduated from college. I started working professionally. 1981 was my first job. But you did graduate. I did. But school I, is very important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know what? School provided me because I really had already decided what I wanted to do. I mean, they didn't have a degree in voiceovers at UCLA. But it provided a safe space for me to be, to train. Because whether it's voice acting or standing in front of the camera and my face being on camera, my whole body and the makeup and hair and all that stuff, it doesn't matter. It's still acting. I think in, in some ways it's, it's, a, it's a bit tougher because yeah, it's just different. It's not tougher. It's just different. Because I, all I have is my voice. I don't have the reinforcement of a wig, of makeup, of um, I, I also don't have to memorize lines. You know, I, I can use the script and stuff like that. So there's plus points to it. And, you know, we've had so many guest stars on The Simpsons. Some of them come in and they, they don't. They're, you have to be, there's something about a microphone and creating a character when all you have is your voice.
voice that to just talk is not enough. There's a te there is a technical skill to it. Not everybody can just, I mean, you certainly understand this. I mean, as, a, as an actor and certainly as a director, that we've gotten some slug. I mean, believe me, get a sports figure in there. We've got a lot of athletes come in and be guest stars on The Simpsons. And they get behind the microphone and it's weak. And they have to really, kind of really pull a performance out of them and encourage them, you know, to be able to, to, to be able to cut it, you know? They have to bring emotion into their voice yeah. and they have to portray different things on different levels. Well, they're trying to communicate right. something and they have to be able to back it up with, and, you know, with intention underneath what it is that they're saying. Well, that's kind of funny because uh, it's, Shakespeare, which used to be that was the only entertainment people got was, was live shows, and then and then you had you know you had the advent of, of radio. So so a lot of the radio people actually didn't didn't transfer into to television and all that because right. because it's it is it is distinctly different. So what do you do live action stuff other than than uh, I mean do you do yeah. live action? Sure. I mean when I when I first got out here, I had never I had no intention really of being on camera. And again, at that time, I was a student at UCLA, and um, I was, you know, I was about 20, I think I was 20, but uh, I played, there was a grad student production of a, of a play, and I was playing a 12-year-old on stage. And of course, I mean, in college, like in high school, it's like you've got, eight, you've got 19 and 20-year-olds playing like you're 60, 65, because that's, that's just what it is. So here I am, it's not unusual to play a 12 year old, but they asked me to drop out of school and do a performance in Hollywood of the same. They wanted me to, I was the only one actually that they had, you know, actually there were two other guys, but they played their own age. Me, I played so much younger, and you know, I got an agent like that. The next thing you know, I was being sent out. I got a pilot, a, a series, you know, thing. It didn't go anywhere, but then I started working on camera. Now I'm balancing animate, you know, voiceover work with on camera. and. Twilight Zone, the movie. I don't know if you saw it. You can rent it. I was the girl that got eaten by a, you know, a wolf, a cartoon, and this was my part. Remember? <laughs> <laughs> I got eaten. Anyway, it was in that. It was in Cheers, Mr. Belvedere, Empty Nest, uh, Godzilla. I, I continued to do on-camera work and do, do some theater. Um, I got married. I had a couple kids. My daughter's 19, my son's 17, and at some point I decided, you know what, This is my passion is voiceovers. The other thing, I just decided, I'm gonna put that aside, but I still do theater. I've done several one-woman shows. Um, I, I have an agent, they, they say, we wanna do whatever you wanna do, we'll do whatever you wanna do, and, and I, I can go out for some stuff right now, but I, I, I love what I do, I love coming here. And I love meeting people. I, I love traveling. I travel around the world and do a motivational speech. You know, it's like an hour and a half long. And I love doing that. I have a production company, and I can I can do it all. I can do whatever I want. It's good fun. Okay, we're gonna open it up for some questions from the audience. And you, you guys can just shout it out if you, if you want. <laughs> Who's got a question? Who's got a question. I have a question. Just when you're on. when you're hanging out with your friends and you don't have a script, how long can you stay in character? <laughs> oh my gosh, you get a t-shirt, man. I don't, nobody's ever asked me that question before. I'm saying, do, do you ever do it? <laughs> well, like, I mean, I could stay in character forever. I you mean, could probably annoy the heck out of people if you really wanted to. You know, I could shock people, but there was a time when I used to do that early on, and I would just sort of test to see if they yes. would recognize my voice. You know, when The Simpsons started out, it wasn't even a net on a network. Fox was, they weren't a network yet. It only reached 70% of the televisions that were out there. So a lot of people didn't even know who The Simpsons were. So I could stand there and I could say, you know, like a decaf latte, you know, <laughs> you know heated at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. 